Getting it real with Wong Chun Wai on the hottest topics, frank, engaging, and candid. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Good evening, Malaysia and followers from around the world. Welcome to our series on the Merdeka series, where we will talk about Merdeka, nationhood, and the people behind the founding of Malaysia, particularly. Tunku Abdul Rahman, our beloved first Prime Minister, who stands way above all the subsequent leaders. Tonight, we have a really special guest. We are really honoured to have with us Dr. Sri Lara Hussein, the CEO and founder of MNC Sachi in Malaysia, a well-known international communications agency. Lara is also a trustee of Yayasan Tunku Abdul Rahman. More importantly, she is a granddaughter of our beloved Bapak Merdeka. She's also a daughter of the late Tunku Katija, the first child of Tunku Abdul Rahman. Uh, welcome, Dara, to the show. We're pleased to really have you. Thank you so much for spending time. Now, um, before I start this interview, I just want to express my uh, deepest condolence on the demise of your mom. Okay, She was such a lovely lady. And uh, of course, uh, she was really special. Yeah. But we will come to the part of your mom later. I think we should pay tribute to this special lady. Now, um, I believe that the National Day has always been something very special to your family, to you, to your mom, the other siblings. And uh, of course, the circumstances this time is quite different for you. Uh, but can you talk about um, what was Chungku like to us, to the ordinary folks? I mean, he was the man who led the chorus and the cheers of Merdeka three times, giving us uh, the goose pimples, the goose bumps until now, okay? Uh, but uh, what was Tunku to you, uh, up close as the grandfather to you? Uh, well, good evening, uh, Dr. Sri Chinwai. Very, very um, uh, happy and honored to, to be able to talk to you. Uh, I know that you've always been remembering uh, my grandfather Tunku every time and writing your article. So I'm very, very pleased and very honored to be able to have this conversation with you uh, and hopefully share some some insights on, on Tunku. Um, yeah, I mean, Tunku has always been known for, you know, his cheers in the state of Medica as the founding father. But, you know, for me, he was uh, such a such a big influence in my life, in our life as the family. He was the patriarch uh, of the family. He was the glue that really brought everybody together, you know, even more so when he retired, because remember in his house in Penang, it was a gathering yeah. of thousands every time, family from all walks of life would, would come together every time. And he was such a huge, he had such a huge presence in our life. We would always refer to him for everything, for my career, my my path, my future, getting married was all had to be approved by him. And he was such a big influence in our life. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think, you know, we continue, uh, you know, sort of always referring to him and, and really trying to live as much as we can with his values and his memory. Mm -hmm. uh, was he known as the tall, dark and handsome man in the family? Yes, I mean, certainly tall. Uh, I think he was, yes, tall, dark and handsome. That's, yeah. that's uh, what people always say about him. He had a lot of style, loved yeah. to dress up, was very fashionable in his day, you know, and, uh, but very simple, very simple. Yes. Yeah, very yes. simple as a man, yes. When we talk about Tonku, uh, we always talk about his... Uh, him embracing uh, diversity. We look at uh, him leading the uh, delegation uh, to negotiate with the British uh, for our independence. He led a delegation of uh, multiracial leaders, even though that he was the uh, president of AMNO, a Malay party, and yet he took along leaders which reflect the uh, multiracial composition of uh, Malaya then. And uh, we look at the first uh, cabinet, he was again a strong reflection of the country's diversity. Um, how did uh, Tonku um, reflect his uh, multiracial values to the family? I mean, we look at it, that his first wife, I mean, that Chi uh, Mariam Chong was a Thai Chinese, and that was your grandma, okay? And that uh, how was these values uh, ingrained into the family? 
Uh, yeah, interesting. But, you know, actually a lot of people don't know that his first wife was Chinese, Mariam, because mm. she died yeah. prematurely due to malaria. And she died mm. when my mother was actually only one one year old okay yeah oh. and and when actually when my mother passed recently very interesting in muslim ritual when mm -hmm. you pass away you're known as tinku karija binti mariam so people okay. were like oh some people actually didn't know that my mother's mother was chinese actually so she's actually half chinese um mm -hmm. actually diversity runs really in our family because uh my niece is married to a chinese my cousin is married to an indian so we're very uh diverse and a lot of interracial marriages within our family and you know we grew up knowing that you know we grew up believing in that it's second nature to us it's normal and that came from him because it's second yes. nature to him diversity is something that we are born and proud to be a part of is a value that we subscribe to right and my yeah. great grandmother was thai my grandmother was chinese um and also in terms of gender you know he was although he's very traditional Tinku, he was very much a proponent of women's rights i mean you know in the 1960s we owe it to him for giving equal pay for equal work to women he had uh first women in the cabinet in his in his cabinet was a woman you know, he's the first yeah. woman in the cabinet and so many, so many examples of his, you know, his relationship with women, you know, he was able to have very good engaging relationships with powerful women from around the yeah. world in you know, Gandhi he was a good friend of his, you know, things like that he was, he's never shy about it, you know, so gender was important, I think race was important for him, something, that, um, you know, is second nature to him. How many people uh, are aware, especially uh, younger people. Uh, that uh, the Tonku, uh, after he retired, he had a Chinese uh, ADC, remember? Yes. Uh, the late Owen Chang. Yeah. yeah. Owen. The guy. Had, yeah. Yes. And that uh, he, oh, even adopted, <laughs> he even adopted, um, he even adopted, he uh, even adopted Chinese uh, children to, to be part of family, right? Yes. Remember? Yes. yes. Uh, there's a there's a few of um, yeah. of my step uncles and aunts mm -hmm. who are Chinese, and, and yeah. you know, living in the residency when I was young, it's full of. Mm -hmm. Uh, multiracial uh, people, right? There were Indian, mm. driver, right. Chinese, Amma, uh, Cook, mm. Malay, you know, so diverse, so dynamic, so rich yeah. in, uh, in diversity, so rich in diversity. And of course, he's a faithful uh, secretary who, who painstakingly uh, took down and typed his uh, written, handwritten columns uh, for the star, as I see it, which was one of the most uh, outspoken and popular columns during the 70s and 80s. And I was the messenger boy, okay? <laughs> because I was a young rookie, I was dispatched to go and collect uh, his uh, uh, typely, well typed written by the secretary, and I got to wait outside there. I mean, that, that they, these were really uh, great uh, moments uh, that as a young boy, uh, at that time, I did not really appreciate the importance of like having to be there uh, you know, you're quite, quite, uh, quite wary and uh, reverent of this great man. But um, he shared a lot of uh, interesting uh, stories about Bintongku, the man, uh, who did not see that, oh, you're, you're, you're young, the chico, you know, okay, uh, you're uh, the, the driver, or he, he, treat, he, he treated people very well. And I think that these were the great values of uh, the Tongku. Now, uh, he's home at uh, Bukit Tongku, and of course... Uh, Nang. Uh, Ayer Raja Road, right? Yeah. And now it's renamed, right? It's renamed. I, it used to be called Ayer Raja Road. Yeah. You had this constant stream of people coming in and out. My, it was just endless. Yeah. Um, the coffee was always uh, ready. The biscuits were always ready to serve to visitors. Uh, but for the family, having this endless stream of people, um, did he had time for the family and was um, privacy uh, invaded because of that? Well, I mean, we we sort of we were born with it, right? We were born sort of knowing that you know who he was, and also I guess I guess uh, enjoyed it actually. You know, we enjoyed the, the 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 number of people that would be over, and it was also interesting. Like so many people from all walks of life would come. You know, from royalty to politicians to even people would just come and uh, queue up to see him to ask him for favors or you know just mm. advice or things like that religious people and things you know it was it was a very happy uh 
home and a happy environment, especially in Penang when he retired. Yeah. He spent most of his years, uh, retirement years in Penang. Um, and so I wouldn't say that, I mean, he made a lot of time for us because we would spend dinner with him mm -hmm. and that's when he would mm -hmm. talk. And we would have very interesting conversations because, you know, we had so much respect for him that, you know, it was quite silent, except he would be the one talking. He would talk <laughs> about politics and about, you know, about what he liked or what he didn't like, you know, and people he liked, people he didn't like, you know, he's very, a lot of sharing. And I wish I had recorded it all, or I wish I'd taken photos, but you know, like in those days, yeah. one photos, right. right? So yes. no, no, nothing was captured, all the conversation and, yes. you know, all the memories of what he said. And, but it's just in my, you know, we just live it and remember, you know, what he said. Yes. Yeah, and a lot of, yeah, very interesting people came. Interestingly, uh, in this present um, uh, political context, you know, when a person uh, has lost his uh, political position or he has retired, um, in most uh, most of this political type or even business type, they will completely disappear. Yeah? It's very cruel, but they just disappeared. But in the case of Tokyo, I remember even after he retired, there was this endless and constant stream of people who continued to visit him. So that says a lot of people who, who, who love him. And uh, there were a lot of pictures in the house. I think you remember. Um, U.S. presidents would have visited him, I think, in the house. Yes. Uh, I mean, you look at the pictures, there were so many. Yes, yes. Like Kennedy came, Prince Philip, Lyndon Johnson, Indra Gandhi, Princess uh, Ma uh, Margaret, Margaret Thatcher. You know, so many, so many. Every time they come to Malaysia, they will, they will definitely pay him a visit, you know. Um, and he was very close to ASEAN, right? So the Thais... Yes. The Indonesians, you know, the, the, the leaders from there would, would come. And I, I, although I didn't live there, yeah. but, you know, when I come back from, from studying and all that, I would be there and I would be able to witness all that and experience all that. Uh, the Tonku, of course, if you look at the pictures, uh, he's, he's uh, often seen with a uh, walking stick. I remember he had a huge collection of uh, walking sticks from all around the world. Did you remember that? Yes, yes, a whole collection. But unfortunately, or whatever, fortunately, all is in the memorial. Oh, okay. Yeah. Right, that's good. Or everything yeah. that he had, we actually donated to the memorial. Given the fact that the Tunku was born in, uh, and raised in Gada, and that uh, his first, first wife is a Thai Chinese from Thai Chinese. Thai, and that, yeah, uh, Thai Chinese. Yeah. Uh, did, did the Tunku, could he converse in um, Thai? Not really. <laughs> I don't, I don't think, I've never heard it, unless I'm <laughs> wrong, but I don't think yeah. so. Yeah. No. Because uh, most Kedahans or Kelantanis, uh, somehow or another, they could speak some uh, smattering yeah, of yeah, Thai yeah. because of the closeness, right? Yeah. yeah. Really. You know that, uh, I want to share something too, um, of his humbleness and people uh, from Kedah, which he have very close uh, relationship. Huh? Uh, my, my, my late father used to run a really tiny roadside store, not a shop, roadside store. Uh, selling hardware in Penang, Penang Chulia Street, okay? And that um, the Tonku knew that my father was born in Kwa, Langkawi, okay? So he, my father was the Kedi Kedahan, okay? And he heard about it. Um, and one day he came, uh, he passed by uh, Chulia Street and he decided that he needed to buy something uh, uh, from a hardware shop. But he didn't want to go to a shop. Uh, so the ADC and all the guards were saying that, why don't you go to a comfortable shop? Why do you want to stop by at a small, tiny roadside stall? He said, that's because it took Orang Kedah. Uh -huh. So, I mean that, uh, so my father was really touched, okay? That uh, he remembered and he kept coming back. He went to buy small items just because he was Orang Kedah. So, uh, it, it, and even the people around the area says, wow, don't go look at that. And that, that, and that sort of values and that humidity uh, spread around the area. Yeah, in um, Penang. This, this was in yeah. Penang. Yeah, this is in Penang. Yeah. So, Kwa uh, Kedai was uh, something Langkawi. He meant a lot to him because he was the DO in Langkawi, right? Yeah. No, um, that's why he's buried in Kedah. I mean, he's buried yes. in the Royal Mausoleum Langa, Kedah. Mm -hmm. That's where he wanted to bury. And I actually found a letter that he wrote. Mm -hmm. Very sad. I think it's, it's, it's in the book where he actually wrote to the government and requested for him to be buried in, in his homeland. In Kedah and not in the national mosque here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, 
everybody knows okay the the the, the, the Tonku will love uh, he love his uh, horses and occasionally of course that uh, when I went to the house he loved his poker game yeah. <laughs> and the occasional uh, the, the occasional the cigar uh, and uh, the uh, occasional brandy or whiskey and that he was no hypocrite uh, he make it known he didn't try to hide his uh, love for these uh, little things uh, in life now um why do you think that the Tuku wasn't afraid of being open um tell us about his love for horses well i mean his love for horses was was lifelong you know ever since yeah. i think he ever since he was young and i think he he loved animals and he decided to in buy race horses and breed them and i think it was it was more of a game or play that he enjoyed and also yeah. to breed them from 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 young so he would buy these horses and have trainers to breed them i think he had about mm -hmm. eight to ten horses and yeah. uh, he kept them very well in air-conditioned stables because it was too hot for them and he would go mm -hmm. quite a lot to to visit and you know and i followed him and in fact my mm -hmm. first horse because i love horses uh was from him okay yeah and uh, so it was something that it was a passion of his and it, uh, and he enjoyed it amongst his friends as well because all his friends enjoyed the, the races, you know, and you know, he won uh, yeah. with his think big, right? Melbourne Cup twice. Melbourne Cup, yeah. Yeah, two years. And that's been none, never been, never happened before. Mm -hmm. Like yeah. win twice, the horse can win twice. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. He has some really good horses. Yeah, yeah. Um, he has good intuition, actually. Good intuition. Yeah. So um, um, when he occasionally he will pay a visit to the uh, Penang Turf Club, and there was this uh, office boy. I think his name was Sunny, right? A Chinese yeah, Sunny, uh, convert, yeah. Sunny. Yeah. Sunny will right now rode his 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 bike to the office in Penang, the P3, and tell everybody. I think you guys better bet today because Tunku is going to the Turf Club now. <laughs> And of course, all of us bet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But no, um, yeah, a lot of a lot of yeah. horses in his life, and yeah. a lot of people that he befriended because of this passion. Yeah. Yeah. Your mom uh, loved horses too, right? Yeah, my mom loved horses. Uh, she mm -hmm. she actually said that this was something that he that she obviously got from the, her her father, yes. her, and I inherited that love also. Uh, but mm -hmm. I don't like race horses, but my mom loved my horses and, you know, she would visit them all the time. And she actually said that she would remember her father when, you know, she would visit the horses. Okay. Yeah. Like yeah. his spirit kind of li lived on with her. Yeah. Uh, talking about your mom, uh, she compiled a book on Tonku's uh, recipe. Huh? Um, can you tell us about your um, Tunku's uh, love for cooking and what kind of cooking were they? Uh, Tunku, my grandfather loved cooking. He was a very good cook. And yeah. uh, he would actually make like roast beef, Yorkshire pudding, oh. or Western. Or he was very good at Western dishes um, mm. and also good at local dishes because he had, uh, he actually enjoyed traditional Malay cooking like you know fish head curry and you know all this very rich lemak kind of food you know yeah. um mm -hmm. so my mom actually compiled a book called Tinku's recipes which she did with her cousin Tinku, mm -hmm. um maimuna to get momina together with um yeah. federal hotel right and it's yeah. a compilation of all his favorite recipes um, okay. and that was some years ago but we we still we still just you know we i think they still publish the copies of the book and mm -hmm. um and all the his favorite cooking is inside there like you know like the curry and the lima and the, all the you know all the traditional kind of northern uh yeah. cooking yeah I I, I I i have copies of the book and mm -hmm. uh you know we kind of like try to you know, try to make, try to cook, but no, obviously not the same, you know, <laughs> uh, as him. Yeah. So I believe that he loved the spicy food, the type of uh, curry, which in northern, in northern uh, dialect, we call it gulai. Eh? Yeah, yeah. Gulai ikan. So one of the, um, 
the his uh, cook and mate, uh, which uh, served the family for a long time uh, at uh, in KL and also in Penang. Uh, after that, subsequently worked at the Star. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, she's she's back. She's retired now, back in Penang, yeah. and she's the only one now that's left yeah. that can actually cook all his dishes. So she's yeah. quite special. So she retired uh, last week after many many years. Uh, at the start cooking for us. So I was one of the uh, beneficiary where I could tell him the sambal blachan that I wanted, the gulai ikan pari, that he, and he would tell me this is what the tungku like and that's what I like. Yeah. So every time that uh, yeah, I come every Merdeka day, uh, I would uh, organize a makan session for clients of ours and the VIPs to the star uh, to eat uh, the uh, favorite dishes of uh, tungku. And she was really very proud that uh, to share with uh, the, the clients uh, what the Tunku was like. So these are the living the connections that uh, uh, we still have. Yeah. Uh, but uh, it was yeah, fully, fully, fully away, but uh, it's amazing. Now, um, now I want to talk about your mom. Okay, it is important uh, because uh, I've met her. I've uh, got to know her a bit a bit. Now, um, I have been, been the firstborn child, okay, uh, to the Tunku. I mean, it's never easy. You carry the weight because uh, you have to be seen uh, to be proper, yeah. And she was growing up. She was growing up in Kedah, which was pretty conservative then. Okay, uh, what was it like for her? I mean, she goes to school. People say, "Oh, it too, Anna, uh, Onku." Okay, so what was it like for her? Well, like I said, you know, she lost her mom at a very young mm -hmm. age when she was one. So she was very close mm -hmm. to my grandfather, to Tunku, because you know he had to look after her. And growing up. Then during the war, they went, you know, through through war. She was uh, living in Kulim, where he was district officer at that time. And I think they she had to be moved around several times to live with her aunties because he was very busy because he was doing his campaigning as well. Um, but they had a very close relationship, um, and you know, she actually is very much like him. And the more I think about it, she follows his values like to the T, you know, her simplicity, her sense of integrity, her compassion, her care for people, um, you know, her sense of just living life to the fullest, you know, she lived life to the fullest, driving till she's 89, uh, having a lot of friends, very popular, uh, but just simple, simple lifestyle, you know, no yeah. fanfare, no luxury in terms of, you know, needing to show, yeah. not materialistic, uh, just very simple and uh, yeah, a wonderful, wonderful mother. And always very pleasant without this air of uh, pretentious, uh, which uh, some uh, VIP in the family like to put on, right? She was really uh, down to earth, just like Dunku. Yeah, very down to earth. And it's very interesting how she emulates his mm. values because that's what she learned from him, you know? And mm. I think that's how it's trickled down to the family because we didn't grow up listening yeah. to conversations about business or listening about corporate Malaysia. It wasn't in our in our DNA, you know, yeah. it was all about either politics, either di diplomacy, or about social values, about people, about religion, but never business. So we, you know, like I was clueless about yeah. business, you know, and so was my mother, because she, yeah. she was, she didn't know anything about business, you know. Very interestingly, um, a few weeks back, I discovered uh, that uh, your, the Tunku uh, sent your mom uh, to be a to the, to a to be a border uh, to stay full time uh, in the uh, convent like yeah, school in Penang. convent because he was too busy so at the age of 12 13 she was sent to light street in boarding school until she was about 17 18 17 yeah and then she went and uh, did hairdressing in singapore mm. the fact he, that he wanted her to no be independent okay yeah uh, more importantly, the Tunku had no qualms of sending her uh, to a Catholic uh, convent school. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. Exactly. So yeah. He actually lived and learned, mm -hmm. you know, with the nuns and things like that. Yeah. Different yeah. culture, uh, different religion, yeah. Uh, for viewers watching this, uh, the Convent Light Street uh, is the oldest uh, convent school yeah, uh, in, in, in this country and probably in, in Asia. Mm. Uh, it was founded by uh, three French nuns uh, who came all the way uh, from France. Uh, 
they came, five of them came, only three of them survived and made their way into Singapore and subsequently to Penang. Two died on the way to, uh, to Malaya. Now, um, talking about that, um, I, I want to share more about, uh, to talk more about your, your again, uh, about uh, back to uh, Tonku. Okay, now, um, I know that um, uh, over the uh, over the subsequent, uh, um, the last uh, years, okay, I mean, that, uh, I mean, when we talk about, uh, when we talk about Bindika, it's, it's always about um, leadership. I mean, you can't escape from the fact that it's all about uh, leadership. Um, you have, you have seen uh, so much, okay? Uh, the Tungku down all the way. Uh, why do you think that the Tungku has been quite different uh, from the leadership uh, then? I mean, that uh, you know, Malaysia is uh, coming to celebrate the 62 years uh, and that uh, we cannot escape from the fact that, that Tungku will always be there. Uh, not even the subsequent leaders. If we, when we talk about celebration, is Tunku cannot escape. I mean, there were other leaders. Why do you think that the Tunku will be different from the subsequent leaders and even the present kind of uh, leadership, the kind, present kind of politicians? Why was he so different? Because I think he was the beacon of unity, the beacon of diversity, and he he will always be that right he will always that's yeah. what he stood for and that's what people equated him to and for as long as we live he was the one that united everybody together you know to you know building on to the road of independence when he went on the journey of independence and he was the one that brought everybody together he tried to unite all his all the races to to fight for our independence you know to the british so yeah. he will always remain as the father of unity right the father yeah. of 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 that of independence so i think when it comes to Merdeka, people remember him which i'm so thankful and grateful for because i think that there has to be some memory of him i just wished yeah. honestly that the younger generation will know him better because mm -hmm. even if when I do my own research, a lot of the young people don't really know much about him. They don't know what kind of man he was. They don't know what he did or some of his achievements. So I wish the younger generation could learn more about him. And I, I just hope that, you know, it's something that, you know, will education will yeah. continue to talk about him and that conversations will continue to talk about him. Like the things that you write about will continue to talk about him, to live and to talk about his legacy. Because otherwise, you know, yeah. as we get older, right, the younger generation will get yeah, and we won't remember. And so sometimes I wish, honestly, I wish that the leaders sure. could do that more, you know, to remember him and remember what he did. Uh, Lara, your Lara, your father was a diplomat. Yeah. And uh, and obviously, obviously, like uh, for your mom and your and you yourself and Sharifa, your sister, uh, it was the life in a suitcase. You had to you had to be uprooted uh, every four years, five years, uh, and travel all around the world. Um, what was it like to be a diplomat. to have a dad as a diplomat and you as a uh, as children of a diplomat? traveling from place to place and what was the uh, the impact of uh, seeing the world opening, opening up my mind for you i mean it, it, it well yeah you know i never lived here right because i left malaysia when i was about yeah. three but yeah. um it was very obviously very enriching you know you learn different cultures experiences you're so exposed at a young age you learn different mm -hmm. languages uh you you go to different schools uh, you 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 know, it's fascinating and you don't really realize the impact it has on you because you're so enriched in your mind. You know, I've lived yeah. in Iran, I've lived in the States, I've lived in Australia, I've lived in China. So I, I've learned so many different cultures and I've had so many friends from all over the world. Um, but the downside is that, you know, you don't really have strong roots here. Like, you do, I don't have school friends that are here. So my network... I don't have a strong network here because I don't have a school network. Like you would have a school network. I don't have a school yeah, network because yeah. my friends are from all over and I, I don't, I'm not in touch with them anymore. Um, yeah. And actually, I think the interesting thing that I wanted to just relate is that after when I was in England, uh, my grand, 
thought Ed Dunkel actually wrote a letter to me and asked me to come back. And he said, you know, it's time for you to serve or do something for the country because you've been away for so long. Mm -hmm. So I came back and he wanted me to join Wisma Putra, which I interviewed for and got a place. Okay. But um, I thought, no, I can't be a diplomat. You know, that means travel, you know, living abroad again. I wanted mm -hmm. to really understand Malaysia and discover Malaysia. So I wanted to come back and kind of discover this country. So I didn't take on his wish, which I think he was very disappointed about mm. because I didn't want to join politics at that time. And he really wanted me to do something to serve the country because he feels that there's no other job. Mm. <laughs> Except to serve the country. Except to serve the country. Yeah. Either you're in politics or you join mm. service. foreign service. Yeah. You have traveled around the world uh, as a child and that uh, in your job, I presume that you also would have done the same thing traveling around the world. Uh, you know, our heart uh, is always with Malaysia and this is our country. Um, sometimes that the uh, Malaysians are very critical of ourselves um, and we make comparison to other countries. Uh, like for example, that uh, not many of us are, have become so jaded uh, uh, that we have lost the trust in the institution and in our politicians. Even when they sometimes when they speak the truth and we think that it really are uh, not real or not, you know, <laughs> like possible our inflation rate uh, at two point three. You know, I think it's it's really true because when you compare with the ASEAN countries, because we are subsidized, that's why it's it's low. But you know, there's always this uh, uh, skepticism. Now, um, as as a Malaysian, as a Malaysian who has traveled around the world, okay, and that we are at this juncture we are celebrating our 62 years of independence as a malaysian okay what would you want to see for this country or others what you want it to be as we move forward mm, well you're right you know we live in a very beautiful country i think that people here maybe they tend to be a little cynical and i think we tend to complain a lot and don't realize that actually we live in harmony it's yeah. fighting we all get along well uh, no matter what race color, gender you are. I have friends from all walks of life, all different races, right? We live in, in a beautiful land and, and uh, you know, a beautiful country. And I think that sometimes we don't appreciate or don't realize our true spirit of being Malaysian. And it takes crisis for us to know who we are, right? It takes a flood to know how much we love each other and how we are he can help each other. It takes a pandemic to show how we all come together and how we are compassionate as a, as a race, as a country. Uh, so I have a lot of optimism about this country. Like my daughters live abroad and work abroad, but I would like them to come back and work here and live here and settle here. Um, and I have a lot of faith and a lot of um, positivity about about Malaysia and I, I hope that the institutions can make this a better place it can only get better unity can only be strengthened right um, it can only be better I feel and I just hope that we're moving towards a greater path of people appreciating what we have and and the institutions helping to just make it better for everybody. That's, Thank you, Lara. That's all. Really, that's all that matters, right? <laughs> correct. That's all that matters. Yeah. Uh, these simple words. Thank you, Lara. I really appreciate that you have taken time off uh, to share with me and for together with me and other Malaysians uh, to hear what the Tonku was like. You know, in your little important uh, precious <laughs> insight as part of the family and that the uh, Vimalaysians will always, will always be thankful and grateful to the Tunku um, for just uh, leading the nation to independence uh, without shedding a single drop of blood. Yes. Uh, not, many, not many countries can do that. No, definitely, right? Yes, I um, hope. Yes, thank you so much again, that's Sri Chunwai, because you have done so much. Please continue on with your writings. I love reading your you. writings. <laughs> Uh, thank you once again, Laura, uh, to Malaysians, uh, just to wish everybody a happy Merdeka and of course, uh, for Malaysia. Laura, thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Good night.